Hello, my name is Julie White. I am a middle school teacher for students with multiple severe disabilities. I am also a graduate student at Morningside College. My research is titled The Impact of Short-Term Memory Activities on Special Education Students. Specifically, my research focuses on students with moderate to severe intellectual impairments. A review of literature indicated that there are currently many theories about how short-term working and long-term memory interact. Before addressing the basis for my study, we need to have a common understanding of the short-term and working memory processes. The model I've chosen is based on research by Gather Cole and Alpha Way from 2008. This model involves input from auditory and visual senses feeding into the short-term memory, which for people without cognitive impairments holds about seven items of information for about 20 seconds. In this model, information enters the short-term memory before the information is able to be manipulated by the working memory. The working memory is primarily where we formulate new ideas and understandings of information. On this slide, I have a graph from research by Van der Moen and Associates, which shows the difference in short-term memory capacity growth between children with normal cognitive function, that's the blue line, and moderate cognitive impairments, that's the red line. For my research, my participants were children with moderate and severe intellectual impairments, although my personal observation of students with severe impairments would be that their trajectory is very similar to the line, red line of students with moderate cognitive impairments. Even with a modified curriculum, my students have difficulty recalling and retaining new information. I wanted to see if I could improve their short-term memory capacity with the hope of increasing the amount of information they could manipulate in the working memory and improve their cognitive skills. Again, there was disagreement in the literature as to whether short-term memory capacity can be improved. This is because this is a relatively new field of study. Some re researchers, such as Kundu and Associates, and she and Associates, determined that short-term memory capacity was able to be improved through training. Other researchers found that most of those studies that show short-term memory capacity can be increased were funded by companies that are selling memory training programs and that the studies had inherent bias. Two meta-analyses found that improvement could be made, but that the researchers had only looked at participants with normal cognitive skills or cognitive impairments such as autism or ADD, not at students with intellectual impairments. The two studies also showed gaps in the research. Almost all of the research was based on computer-based programs that made the cognitive training seem like a game. The problem becomes that these programs focus on visual skills, which makes them non-accessible for students with visual processing or hand-eye coordination impairments. They also do not use explicit instruction and were unrelated to daily activities, which present, prevents the skills from being generalized. I chose the curriculum Ready, Set, Remember by Mens, Debney, and Drews because the activities were accessible to students with moderate to severe impairments. They are also similar to daily activities, are teacher delivered rather than computer delivered, and practice verbal and visual memory skills. This research also furthers the discussion on whether short-term memory capacity can be changed. If explicit instruction in these types of strategies is effective and a good use of educational time. The research was conducted using a pre-test, post-test ABA design for reliability. The data was collected by the building psychologist using an adapted visual and verbal working memory subcomponent of the Weschler 5 intelligence scale for children. The measure needed to be adapted because the policy of the school does not allow students to be tested with this test without educational purpose for the student. 
Instruction was daily for 10 to 15 minutes, and activities included mental rehearsal, application of verbal directions, matching visual patterns such as stringing beads, and following multi-step directions. Participants needed to have verbal communication skills to complete this study. They also needed to receive 60 to 80 percent of their instruction in the special education setting. This resulted in four eligible students from my building who were females between the ages of 12 and 14. Two were from the level two classroom and two were from my classroom, which is the level three classroom. Using a t-test to compare the means of the pre-test and post-test scores with an alpha 0 0.05, the scores indicated that the activities did not statistically improve short-term memory capacity. The p-value of the t-test was 0 0.092. There are several possible reasons why short-term memory capacity did not improve after these activities. The most obvious is that, like the previously mentioned research indicated, short-term memory capacity cannot be improved with training. It is also possible that students with moderate to severe intellectual impairments needed longer instruction than students without. It could also be that the curriculum was not effective or that, that adaptations to the Weschler 5 interfered with the measure's accuracy. Additionally, there may have been instructional errors teaching the curriculum by the teacher. The teacher's instructional errors could be remedied by the assistance of an instructional coach. Likewise, the adaptation of the Weschler 5 could be remedied by getting permission and using the actual Weschler 5 subtests. The instruction could be lengthened by using more activities or modifying and repeating some of the activities to extend the instruction past five weeks. An interesting potential influence on the results of this study is found in a study by Swanson from 2014. He noted that instruction that focused on visual strategies lowered the overall short-term memory capacity of students with visual processing impairments. Likewise, focusing on verbal strategies decrease the overall short-term memory capacity of students with oral processing impairments. Swanson suggested that trying to overcome the impairment used up some of the me memory capacity, limiting the overall capacity further. It is possible that the combination of verbal and visual activities in this study worked against students with impairments in those areas. Future research could align students with instruction that works in the stronger subcomponent so that an impairment in one area or the other does not interfere with learning and building short-term memory capacity. Also, the review of literature found in other studies that participants with higher short-term memory capacities improve more than participants with lower short-term memory capacities. This could imply that separating students with moderate intellectual impairments from students with severe intellectual impairments could result in a more significant increase. Also increasing the sample size would increase the external validity of the results. As an educator, I discovered a lot about my own teaching during this study. Even though I thought I limited the amount of content, had a slow pacing, and provided breaks to meet my students' needs, I realized I was still presenting far too much information during instruction. One of the most effective strategies I've taken away has been to incorporate chunking more effectively. By allowing students to work with smaller amounts of information at one time and breaking larger concepts into smaller subcomponents, I have been able to keep my students more engaged in instruction. I have also increased the number of times I check for understanding during the lesson. I found that strategies to teach students with short-term memory impairment, such as explicit instruction, making connections to previous knowledge, comparing information within concepts, has helped my students retain information. I have also increased the amount of repetition of information, but continuously try to use new materials or new engagement strategies to keep the material interesting. 
The study by Swanson has caused me to reconsider using multisensory strategies for three of my students. While none of them has been diagnosed with processing impairments, two of them seem to retain information presented orally much better than information presented visually. Likewise, one of my students doesn't seem to grasp any of the information from listening, but does attend to visual stimuli. I've been working with the paraeducators in my room to have them adapt my group instruction to meet the needs of the individual student. Some of my students are receiving extra verbal cues, and one of my students is receiving additional visual supports. To support my students with in visual processing impairments, I model my thinking out loud, allow my students to speak their, their thinking out loud, and if my students were in gen ed classes, it would benefit them to be able to record content to listen to it separately. Also, the repetition of recorded content would help them. Students with visual impairments also would benefit from listening to text rather than trying to read it and having assessments read to them. My students can't read co for content yet, so these last two ideas are always used in my classroom. We also use the strat last strategy, which is to allow verbal answers to be written down. Often my um, answers are from selecting a picture and then a paraeducator selects the picture that the student has indicated. For students with auditory processing impairments, the use of visual schedules and task lists are very helpful. The use of pictures or visuals or manipulatives is also beneficial. In the academic setting, it is helpful for students to have notes in advance for lectures. Many of these strategies are similar to the strategies used for students with autism. In the general education setting, students with limited short-term memory capacity should be allowed to use the word bank, use a calculator when not assessing computation, and have additional opportunities outside of class to review information. For my students, I think of this as repeat, repeat, and repeat, but each time I try to make it have variety. Some strategies which help students with limited short-term memory capacity are also best practice for other students, such as decreased distractions, identifying and focusing instruction on essential learning outcomes, and posting visual reminders and referring to those essential learning outcomes during the lesson. While my study didn't demonstrate that overt instruction for five weeks is an effective use of instructional time, I have continued using concepts from the activities modified for my students' abilities. One of the students has demonstrated significant improvement in her ability to converse and follow directions. Additionally, I have been more aware of my instructional strategies and implement them more carefully to meet the needs of my students. I'm hoping that you have gained some insights into strategies that can help your students. Thank you.